Hello, everybody. I'm Seema Kumar, and I want to welcome you today to a very special Tuesday talk. Joining me today is Greg Simon. First of all, welcome to Cure. Thank you. Greg Simon, he's worked for two vice presidents and also was part of the President Biden's cancer moonshot and is an expert on healthcare policy and healthcare financing. And so we're going to ask him a few questions about, you know, what is going to impact healthcare from a policy perspective in the next year, in the next five years, in the next decade. So, Greg, welcome. Welcome Thank to you. Cure. Good, great to be here again. Yes, and so you now are the CEO of Simon Innovation. Yes. Yes. And what do you focus on? I focus on companies that help patients. So I am a consultant to a number of cancer companies, early stage cancer companies, in the cancer detection space, which we have a lot of work to do and be very impactful. Uh, but I'm also working with a variety of companies that are doing some amazing things. A company I'm working with in Europe is looking at people who have survived the worst cancers, reverse engineering their genetics and seeing what we can learn about them that we could use to help other people. And, and the company is named after Rosalind Franklin. So that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and then I do, uh, I'm on a lot of nonprofit boards around different rare diseases in particular, uh, and also working with uh, the group that or that's oversees the iSpy trials in breast cancer at UCSF with Laura Esserman. And I'm also on uh, groups like Count Me In at the Broad that focus on markers in different cancers that we can learn from people who donate their uh, uh, tissue, Tissues, blood, yes. tumors, et cetera. Because you to need be all that data yes. in order to be able to like really figure out what's going on. Yes. And, you know, cure cancer once and for all, which is what we all want. Yeah, and I mean, so yeah. the more we look, the more we find. It sounds like Yogi Berra, but yeah. uh, that's that's where we are. Yeah, it was 1975 that we declared war on cancer. Oh. Uh, we're <laughs> still fighting. Yes, we are. <laughs> and so what's the goal of the cancer moonshot? Well, the current cancer moonshot, the second version, uh, is to reduce the death rate in half uh, in the next 25 years. So how do you do that? More achievable. More achievable. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's, I ask people this question. Uh, imagine if there were no technological in innovations or advancement for the next 10 years. What would you do to save more lives from cancer? Because we're all techno-optimists. We all think there's a solution around the corner, like the GLP-1 drugs that are defeating obesity. We all think there's a magic bullet. In cancer, there will not be a magic bullet. But... Uh, if there were no technological innovations, what would you do? And the answer is all the things we know we should be doing now, but we don't. Better nutrition, better active and reimbursed prevention, uh, being able to get all of the solutions we already have to everybody who needs them, which we fail at miserably. So I'm not that excited about the next version of CAR-T as I am the next version of getting basic cancer care to everybody in America and eventually the world with cancer. I have chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The two drugs I was taking, I'm in remission now, were $20,000 a month each sticker price. My insurance company hates me. But I paid $200 a month because I have retired government insurance. How does a family of four making $50,000 afford that kind of treatment? That's, my, that's how we're going to save more lives from cancer. When we discover new things, my question to all of the people who are excited about it is, is it accurate, is it accessible, and is it affordable? Yep. If it's not those three things, it's not going to change many lives. Yeah. So really, the innovation, there are you know, plenty of breakthroughs to be had, but the real innovation needs to come at the implementation level, access, affordability, and you know, clinical care That's of right. what already exists. Is, is and that could actually reduce deaths by half, is the point, right? Ex exactly. Yeah. It's going to come from here. Yeah. <laughs> if we have empathy, yes. which we're in short supply right now, if we have empathy, we will think about how to distribute what we can do now to save people from treatable cancers. And that is what I am focused on right now. You know, it's interesting because, you know, you come from the policy arena, and you've, we've just talked about accessibility and affordability. And one of the biggest landmark legislations that we've just passed is the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes. Tell me a little bit about drug pricing and how that's going to transform access and affordability. 
there's a terrific meme of a woman complaining that she seems to have a headache and and uh, she can't focus and she can't concentrate. And as the camera pans around the woman, you see she has a nail in her forehead. And her husband says, maybe it's the nail in your forehead. And she says, don't try to argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> so for years, pharma's nail in their forehead has been the fact that the American people hate their pricing and hate their ads. Mm -hmm. Now, I was at Pfizer for two and a half years, and I saw how we set prices, and it is not pretty. And it is not logical. So I think that the, the negotiation that was made possible through the Inflation Reduction Act will actually resolve some of Pfizer's, not Pfizer's, Pharma's, political tension with the American consumer. And that will be in their long-term interest. And unfortunately, Wall Street doesn't do long-term interest. They do quarterly interest. So I understand there's a lot of whining but I think at the end of the day, they'll be glad we took the nail out of their forehead. Yeah, and you know, the key question that I think we keep getting asked is, how is that going to impact innovation? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, as you mentioned, you know, yes, Wall Street, uh, Wall Street is watching, investors are watching, your shareholders are watching. How do you take that kind of risk that you need to take in a company that's making all these expensive drugs um, you know, without having some level of return? Great question. Yes. I am, if I were an innovator, I would be insulted by the idea that if I don't make as much money as possible, I'm not going to work on something I think will save the cancer that killed my mother. So when I look at the innovators I have met in my life, and I've met hundreds, none of them started by looking at maximizing same, profit. Same, same here. I've, uh, me too, I've worked for a pharmaceutical company, but no, not a single scientist I know and had worked for did it for the return. That's they did right. it because they wanted to solve a disease. That's right, and they're in the lab. If their product is a multi-billion dollar drug like a brutinib that I take, they don't get more money. Pfizer gets the money or uh, AZ or, or Glaxo. That's not where people are motivated. They're motivated to do something with their life on this rock spinning around a fireball to be able to look back at the end of their life and say, I made a difference. So I, I don't buy the argument that you have to be able to make as much as possible to have a business or to have a mission in your life. If you look at the history of a group, the venture capitalist who backed that made $3 billion. The scientist who found the receptor made a salary. So who's innovating what? Um, I, I, I am very optimistic that making medicines more affordable will lead more people to come into the space, not less. A lot of people don't want to be involved if it means that they're going to make a product that their family can't afford. So uh, switching gears a little bit, you know, I think um, at the end of the day, healthcare costs cannot all be attributed to drugs, right? right There's right. a whole a other, whole other world. <laughs> calls cost structure, right? I yes. mean, the drug pricing is the easy one, low-hanging fruit that everybody goes after, but there's bigger fish to fry Absolutely. in the healthcare arena. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, because you are also uh, an expert in healthcare financing. Yes. Tell me how you think about that and what's required to take innovations such as the one you just described a scientist discovers something, but without the financing and the backing of an investor, it's not going to go anywhere. So w there are people who are just looking to maximize return, and there are people who are looking to build value. The people who are looking to maximize return, especially in the private equity space, have are, are ascendant at the moment, and that's unfortunate because people investing in companies for an exit is very different than people investing in a company for a mission. So I'm a mission investor, I'm not an exit investor. But healthcare has a bigger problem. Um, healthcare is the only sector of the economy, and it is the largest sector of the economy, it's the only sector of the economy that does not have a derivative market. So there is no way to hedge lost sales or increased prices. Now farmers figured this out 200 years ago when they would go to market and get less than they thought they would. So when they plant their wheat, they sell that wheat in the future like a December contract for the next year, and that's how we stabilize prices. 
But in healthcare, it's a cash flow business. If, if Ozempic comes on the market or Zavaldi comes on the market, the payers are faced with a 30, 40, 50% increase in costs and they have nowhere to hedge. So what do they do? They deny access. If Pfizer's developed a new drug and they're worried about lost sales from competition down the road, they don't have anywhere to hedge. So what do they do? They maximize prices. So that is what I call immoral hedging. You make a product too expensive and the insurance company denies it to the patient. This is not good. It's a bad ending. So how do you fix it? If we can trade cotton, I'm from the South, I'm from Cotton State. There are, there are literally 1,200 ways to trade cotton on Wall Street. There's not one way to trade diabetes or melanoma or cancer drugs. So as an example, if, if, if a payer were willing to work with a pharmaceutical company to help fund phase three trials, they could plan ahead for the cost of that drug. They could get a long-term, more affordable contract because they took the risk out for the pharma company in the phase three trial or cut it in half. That lowers the cost of capital for the pharma company. That means they can charge a lower price and make the same margin. Now we're talking. So I and my partner have worked to build a futures market for healthcare, which was finally funded and just received a license uh, this year. It's not operating yet, but it'll be the first healthcare exchange where you can actually take a position on the future of the top 10 selling drugs or the increased cost of treating or decreased cost of treating diabetes after the result of uh, the uh, GLP-1 drugs. Hmm. So if you're uh, DaVita who does dialysis, you want to short uh, diabetes costs because they're going to go down. Uh, and if you're Pfizer, you want to short a list of the top selling 10 drugs in case the selling goes down, you make a hedge profit. If you're United Healthcare, you want to do the opposite. So in everything that's bought and sold in healthcare, there's somebody who needs to hedge it. And now they can through this platform. Similarly, we all know that healthcare costs are always going up and to the right. So how do you as an individual and how do you as United Healthcare plan for increased costs? Well, we've developed with a major actuarial firm products that say, you know what, if you're showing me that the healthcare costs are rising in these hospital services, physician services, devices, drugs, etc. Let's find the best companies in those sectors and create a portfolio of the companies who are also going up and to the right because they're part of healthcare inflation. And now you have a hedge against your future health costs. Now in my 50s, I had no idea what my future health costs would be, but I do now because I have glaucoma, I have leukemia, I've had chemo, so I'm going to get peripheral neuropathy. I can see all that coming, and now I can hedge But it. can we not think outside of the box for the future, right? And this is present day, this is where, this is the reality we live with. Yes. But what if you could imagine a world in which uh, you, you do not have glaucoma, you do not have CLL, you do not have anything else that, you, you know, you are living a healthy life yes. because of prevention, because of focusing on wellness yes. and well care rather than sick care. Yeah. Can you imagine a world like that and what would that world look like? And is it possible for us to achieve it 10 years from now or maybe even five years from now? Uh, I can't imagine that world like that, but not in this brain. Uh, behavioral economists have shown us over and over again that people do the right thing for the wrong reason. So uh, you, you, you should register to vote. Do you need Elon Musk to put you in a million dollar lottery to make you want to register to vote? Apparently so for some people. Um, we all know we should eat better, healthier. We all know we should work out more. But this is one big problem with the human brain. We don't look ahead. And, and there is, there's reasons for that. And, and think about the early humans. What were they supposed to look ahead about? I mean, it was a day-to-day -day survival problem. So now that we have a shelter and food and, and uh, 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 sanitation, we should be thinking ahead. Oh, I'm 50. When I'm 70, I might have this or this, so I should start working to prevent that. Very few people think like that, other than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think AI could help us there? Yes. 
Absolutely. How? Uh, first, by making, by helping you show, by showing you the straightest line between where you are and where you should be, and then helping you get there. Like so it's like a ways for healthcare. Yes, that's a great. I'm stealing that. Yeah. If you, <laughs> exactly. Ways for healthcare. For instance, yes. this ways could say, uh oh. There's a problem in the road ahead, and that problem is your cholesterol is too high. Yes. Here's what you need to do, and yeah. make it easy to do. You know, our phones represent our subconscious. Yep. We program our phones with all of our biases. Mm -hmm. AI could tell you in your phone that you need to be doing X instead of Y, and here's the reason, uh, so that it's constantly with you. It's a constant reminder. Uh, but at the end of the day, you still have to listen yep. and do the right thing. Yep. Uh, so do I think that will happen? I think it can happen. And I'm hoping uh, AI's first major benefit will be elimination of medical errors because mm -hmm. that happens because we're human. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing will be guiding our thinking of just like I'm, I love that, guiding our thinking the way Waze does our driving so that people don't have to come up with you know, like, well, how do I do that? How do I get gluten out of my diet? How do I, you know, deal with how much exercise do I have to do versus what I want to do? Uh, those are questions that right now, you know, your spouse may remind you, your children may remind you, your friends might remind you. But, you know, having health fairs at big companies where the people who really care about their health get a $25 Starbucks gift card for going to the health fair and checking their blood pressure, that's not helping anything. We need to reach the people who don't want to be reached. And to do that, we have to go where they are. And AI will help us do that. Because where are they? They're in churches. They're in veterans groups. They're in schools. They're, you know, there's all these community ways we can reach people. It's difficult for a human being to do all that. It's a piece of cake for AI to do all that. That's cool. I'm glad to hear you say that. So I want to switch gears for a second and ask you about the Biosecure Act. Yes. You were just on a panel uh, at, here at Cure uh, in the Biofuture um, conference here. Uh, what were you guys talking about and what are your thoughts about the Biosecure Act? So we were talking about two different levels. One level was will it pass and what do you have to do when it passes? That's very practical lawyerly advice in terms of how do you change your supply chain? Mm -hmm. How do you change your workforce? How do you change, do you, if, this only applies if you get government money. Mm -hmm. So do you want government money? Now past a point, uh, past the NIH grant, you don't get a lot of government money in late stage pharma development. You may get a grant from ARPA-H now, but that's for breakthrough things, not for everyday business. So. If you get government money, you have to make some decisions. So that was one level of the discussion, which I am a lawyer, but I haven't practiced in a billion years, so I didn't jump into that part. What I was concerned about, and I'm a fellow of the Asia Society, and the Asia Society has been working on a Pacific Rim effort, cure for cancer, mm -hmm. that would involve all the countries in the Pacific Rim, and right now they're all in but China, because mm -hmm. we won't let them in. Mm -hmm. So my view, is that as a patient advocate, we can't just say to the millions of people in China with cancer, and they have the largest cancer burden, the largest Alzheimer's burden, the largest diabetes burden. We can't just say, oh, we don't care about you because you live over there. I'm not that kind of guy. So my view was China thinks 100 years ahead. We think a year or two. Uh, that's an awful way to think. So if we want to really fix the relationship with China, we need to think 100 years ahead. By which I mean the current leadership of China is not forever. They're old, they're old school. Their children are here. They're learning here. They want to go back to China and take their place. They will have a very different mindset. That's who we should be focusing on. Instead of reacting to the old guard, we should be courting the new guard. That's a long-term strategy. We have to have guardrails. We have to have regulations. The FDA's already got all that. So now we have to change our mind and stop thinking of China as an enemy and think of China as a potential partner improving world health. Our greatest export is healthcare. 
and our greatest strength, I think, is in the arena of breakthrough innovations. Yes. And, you know, that is something that we are not taking full advantage of. Yes. Uh, you know, our, the intellectual, I don't want to call it IP, it's less about the IP piece, it's much more about the breakthrough innovations that are going to transform biomedicine and healthcare. That's right. Because in our culture, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yes. And so we train people to be squeaky wheels. In China, the nail that stands up gets pounded down. So they are trained to work as a group and not to be individually stand out. All of our medical breakthroughs are because people are willing to stand up and say this isn't working and this is wrong. In other cultures, that's looked down on. So that is our natural advantage. And we should, we should use our natural advantage as a, as a diplomatic tool to offer people help. As we did with HIV, as we did with COVID, and now as we can do with cancer. And as we should be doing with women's health. Oh my gosh. Your, what are your thoughts about that and about the ARPA-H grants that were just made and are we investing enough and why aren't we investing enough? Well, we will never invest enough because they're so far behind. Yeah. Uh, because the Senate was all men for so long, we have a lot of prostate cancer funding. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's just the truth of the matter. Uh, and so um, the, uh, let me tell you the, the good news first. The head of NIH, the head of NCI, the head of CDC, the president's science advisor, the head of ARPA-H are all women. That's the first time we've had women in those roles. I urge Kamala Harris, if she wins, not to change a thing. That's the best thing. But what if she doesn't win? What well, if she doesn't win, there was no interest in the Trump administration the last time in the moonshot. Joe Biden asked Mike Pence three times to continue the moonshot. Why wouldn't he? I have no idea. It's sad, very sad. So now I'm thinking, why waste time looking for new people? When this, I've been dealing with NIH, NCI, et cetera, for 40 years. It's the first time there have been women in those jobs permanently, and it's the best team they've ever had as a team. So I, I think that the in women's health, I have friends who have at-home tests for endometriosis. I have another friend who had a, a, a fertility monitor so you can tell where you were in your cycle easily for pregnancy. There are so many things we can do, but the venture capital community hasn't gotten the message yet. The government is just getting the message, but you're years behind. So the, the 250 million for women's health was a wonderful thing. It needs to be 250 billion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, I'm sorry, my mother is 101 years old. Really? She is on, she's physically healthy as she can be. She thinks she's in high school but she knows who we are and she knows who she is. That, and she had one cigarette and one drink a year. So, <laughs> but we're Lebanese, we've got good genes. So <laughs> I look at my mother and I think, what a blessing that I've known my mother this long and that she has survived, you know, the depression and the war and two children. And, and I think, why can't we treat all people equally and not have so much money go to the things that bother men and so little to the things that bother women. And I'm, we're starting to melt that uh, iceberg, but boy, we have a long way to go. And it's not just women's health as it relates to women's organs, right? It's about, right. you know, disproportionately coming down with Alzheimer's or yes. having cardiac issues that are very different. Mental you know, health, postpartum depression. Mental health, postpartum depression, lots of different things. So. Um, finally, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, Fast for Cures yes. was one, one of your brainchild, right? Yes. What was it all about, and where are we now with, with Fast for Cures? Yes. So, I had, when I left the White House in 97, I started a consulting firm. And one of my clients in the biotech world got multiple myeloma. So I was at Union Station in Washington waiting for my fifth grader to come back from a school trip. And my phone rings, and it's my client with multiple myeloma. And he said, Mike Milken, uh, I have a job for you. And I said, Dick, I have a job. Uh, I had a firm. I had employed a half a dozen people. He said, Mike Milken wants a permanent presence in Washington. He goes to Washington and talks to senators and congressmen and presidents, and then he leaves town and they forget about him. 
So he, he wants to plant the flag. And I said, well, that's cool, Dick, but I, you know, I have a job. And I was in government for many years, needed to make a living. And he said, well, you would at least talk to him, wouldn't you? And I said, well, sure. So he had him on hold. So <clears throat> now I'm in my car in the train station talking to Mike Milken. And I'm like, okay. Unprepared. And he does what he always does. Tell me about your family. So I told him about my family. He said, why don't you come have lunch with me in New York? Well, three hours later at the lunch, I had agreed to leave my consulting firm <laughs> and start a nonprofit. And my biggest problem was how to tell my wife. <laughs> so what he said to me, he, he, said, he said something really impactful to me during that lunch. My only scarce resource is time. How many people can say that? And so he said, I need to set up an organization that will, I've already done it in prostate cancer, but I want to speed up everything. And to do that, you have to be in Washington, and I'm leaving it to you how to do it. And I was employee number one, sitting there alone at my desk, and I thought, we will be the catalyst for change. We will not fund grants. We will not fund research. We will fix the problems that every organization has in dealing with their disease, and they don't have time to fix for everybody else. They fix it for themselves. And then they move on. And so you have 100 foundations. They all fix the same problem. It's inconvenient. It's inefficient. So as the analogy I used at the time, which they still use, is you could put a jet engine on a railroad train. And it still would go 55 miles an hour because that's the maximum the track can stand. We at Faster Cures, we're going to fix the tracks for the people building the jet engines. And that's what they've been doing now for 21 years. Uh, I just rejoined the advisory board. And they do this through, I mean, we, we held the most exciting meetings of my career, which we would bring in people from a variety of disease organizations and say, what's your problem? What is the biggest obstacle? They all had the same one, culture. Mm. It was the culture. Not money, mm -hmm. not the FDA, not the science, the culture. Of it can wait, I'm only interested in publishing, I don't know about impact, not sharing data, not sharing medical records. They all had the same problem. So we took them on one at a time. I've been talking about sharing e electronic medical records for 20 years. I've been talking about sharing tissue and blood samples for 20 years. Finally, it's starting to happen, but it took that long. Yeah. That's but that's what we all want, faster cures. And yes. you know, here at, at Cure, we also want to be a catalyst and work with organizations that are doing the same thing, which is really transform healthcare, advance healthcare, and help people find cure, and even you know, move on to being in the arena of well care yes. and healthcare yes. rather than sick care. Yes. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, as a new grandfather, I have a three-year-old grandson and a one-year-old grandson. What you just said is exactly what I want to do, is figure out a way for them to avoid the health problems of their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, uh, before they have to deal with it. I think we all can share that goal. Well, cheers to that future. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> How do you define cure? What, is, what does cure mean to you? Oh, to me, it means you can live a, as close to your normal expected life as healthily as possible. doesn't mean you don't have a disease. It means it doesn't affect you that much, which I hope is where I am with my leukemia because since I was diagnosed in 2014, it hasn't affected my life except once when I got in the hospital because I got uh, no white cells because of my medicine. But as a general matter, it's not affecting my life. It's not affecting my future. I'm fortunate to have great doctors and can afford my meds. <coughs> but for most people, the saddest thing is losing a friend, a spouse, a partner too soon. We all know we have to go. But that doesn't mean you have to live in pain and misery half of your life or the last 20 years of your life. To me, that's a cure. It doesn't mean that we never develop cancer. It means we know how to put it back in the box. So cure is not absence of disease, but the existence of solutions for yes. healthy living. For healthy living for a full life, whatever that means to you. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for joining Tuesday Talks at Cure. Thank you so much.